Justin Trotschvig. He is the founder of the Center for Inquiry Canada, an educational charitable organization advancing science and secularism. He's a board member of the Canadian Secular Alliance, so you know what side he's on. And a regular spokesman on church state separation, skeptical inquiry, and fundamental freedoms. He hosts Think Again TV. He appears regularly on John Oakley's AM640 show Culture War, as well as a conspiracy show on Vision TV. We know where you stand on this one, just from your experience. He also publishes frequently on the National Post Religion blog. Welcome, Justin. Busted supporters, didn't you? <laughs> or everybody's just so polite. Now, on my right, Father Philip Cleveland. He was educated in English literature and in philosophy, Oxford and Cambridge, and he received into the Catholic Church in 1989. He had theological studies in Rome. He was ordained in 2001. In 2011, he transferred permanently, as permanently as permanently is to the Oratory in Toronto, where he teaches in the Philosophy and Theology programs at St. Philip's Seminary. Welcome, Father. <laughs> now, everything is strictly timed tonight, and my time is up. I will tell you that um, in, the, in the very traditional way of a coin toss, the Father is going to start first. Your 15 minutes, Father. Not how the world is, but that it is. This is the mystery. Ludwig Wittgenstein, whose words these are, was perhaps the greatest and certainly one of the most influential of 20th century philosophers. He wasn't what you call a believer. And yet tonight I'll be developing the insight that his words convey. I'll be arguing that the mystery Wittgenstein identified points ultimately to the mystery of God. The mystery of God arises for us inescapably once we confront the most basic of all phenomena, not how the world is, but that it is. What Wittgenstein has in mind is something I shall be calling the sheer existence of things. This is the single astonishing fact that the world is, rather than the countless more familiar facts which together make up how it is. To see what this is about, let's consider the difference between thought and reality. Suppose there's someone you love. You can think of him endlessly, and the better you know him, the richer your thought of him will be. And yet thinking about him can't make him real. To be real, he must exist, not just as an object of thought, but with a being exterior to thought, in excess of anything that thinking alone can produce. That's what reality is, its sheer existence, existence beyond thought. It's what you grasp when you no longer have to bring the person you love to mind, because astonishingly he is there, present, before you. What you grasp in that moment is what makes him real, in excess of anything thought can summon or can encompass, you grasp the sheer existence of him. You're struck, in other words, not by how he is, but by that he is. How he is is what makes it possible to think of him. It's everything that makes him who and what he is. Let's say it's the idea of him. But how he is isn't the same as that he is. That he is is something different, something other. Beyond the idea of him, we can experience his reality, his actuality, his sheer existence. Now, so far I've been talking about the sheer existence of an individual, of someone you love, just as an example. Wittgenstein, of course, is talking about the world, but the argument's the same. The distinction between how something is and that it is applies not just to individuals, but to the world as a whole. The world itself is thinkable, can in principle be made an object of thought. This gives us how the world is, the idea of the world. But beyond the idea, beyond everything thought can contain, there is the fact that the world is, 
that it is real, that it exists. And this, Wittgenstein says, is the mystery. Now, why does Wittgenstein call this a mystery? Well, one reason is that sheer existence is so fundamental and so encompassing that we tend to take it for granted. Our focus is the how of things. We're immersed in discovering the world, absorbed in trying to understand it. And yet, discovery and understanding presuppose that the world exists and that it is there in the first place to be discovered and understood. It's this which is so obvious, <coughs> so basic, that we take for granted and tend to make invisible. Retrieving it induces a sense of strangeness, perhaps a kind of disconcertion. It's not unreasonable in this context to speak of a mystery. But there's more to it than that. We speak of mystery not simply in the context of what is strange or disconcerting. We speak of mystery in the most fundamental sense when explanation has been defeated. So when Wittgenstein says that the sheer existence of the world is mysterious, he means that in the sheer existence of things, we encounter something before which explanation breaks down. And he's right about that. Sheer existence is, in a very fundamental way, inexplicable. To see why, let's think about how explanations work. A classical way of putting it would be to say that explanations depend on the natures or essences of things. On this classical understanding, explanations involve finding out what these natures or essences are and how they express themselves. But of course, there isn't just one kind of explanation. The immense complexity of things means that very many kinds of explanation are generated. We have the sciences, of course, physics, chemistry, biology, and their numerous derivatives. But we also have the kinds of explanation proper to humanistic studies, such as history, sociology, and psychology. Some people, as it happens, think that sooner or later, we will be able to do away with humanistic kinds of explanation. History, psychology, and the rest will one day be absorbed into the supposedly more fundamental kinds of explanation offered by the physical sciences. Others deny this. Still others aren't sure one way or the other. But for my purposes, such disagreements are of no importance. What is important is that all kinds of explanation have something in common. They all presuppose that something or other exists, and then proceed to try to explain why, on the basis of what exists, things happen as they do. None of them, however, explains why anything exists. None of them, we might say, explains why there is something to explain. And this is no accident. Explanations tell you what kinds of things there are and why they function as they do. But what something is and why it functions as it does can never tell you why it exists. We need to be absolutely clear about this. So take yourself as an example. You are a human being, not a mere idea, a possibility, but something actually existing. It's manifest that being human doesn't explain why you actually exist. Existence isn't part of what it means to be human. So your existence must originate in something else. And at this point, of course, it seems very natural to say that it originates in the particular event of your parents conceiving you. This surely explains why you are. But that's a mistake. Your parents' existence is as much in need of explanation as yours is. Of course, their conceiving you explains something. It explains what you are. And, doubtless to some degree, it explains who you are. But that's all it explains. And so your sheer existence, even in the moment of your coming to be, remains mysterious. And of course, it's not just you or your parents of whom this is true. Take anything in the world you like. Take the world itself. However deeply you penetrate what it is, and why it functions as it does, you'll find nothing that tells you why it exists. And because of this, existence defeats explanation. It is, as Wittgenstein says, the mystery is not how the world is. The mystery is that it is. The defeat of explanation I'm speaking about is universal. The mystery of sheer existence is something which not even the most fundamental kinds of scientific explanation can dispel. How could they? If science were able to explain existence, 
it will first of all have to free itself from taking existence for granted. But in doing so, it will become a science focused upon precisely nothing. For nothing is what remains when the assumption of existence is suspended. And of course, the idea of a science with nothing to investigate is absurd. However basic the agents or processes which science invokes, their actuality, their sheer existence, necessarily remains unexplained. So not only is science incapable of dispelling the mystery of existence, science as an exploration of what's real depends radically upon that mystery for its very possibility. But as I've already said, my argument tonight isn't just about the mystery of existence. It's about the mystery of existence pointing inescapably to the existence of God. It's time for me to try to spell out why I think this is so. And first of all, I want to say that the idea of the existence of God is in danger of becoming too familiar. We think we know what the idea of God amounts to. We think we know what is involved in affirming or denying that God exists. I can't avoid disrupting these assumptions. What we mean by God, what it means to consider whether or not God exists, are stranger and more mysterious adventures of thought than we might suppose. Now, let me be as explicit as possible. The world's existence is a mystery. The world itself cannot explain its existence, cannot tell us why it exists. And yet, despite this, the why question seems inescapable. The fact that the world cannot answer it does not mean that it's a misguided or unintelligible question to ask. On the contrary, we naturally and spontaneously search for an opening, a direction, perhaps, in which the why question can be posed and in which an answer can be, however provisionally, indicated. And that opening or direction has a certain shape or orientation. We know that the world's existence cannot come from the world itself. We know, then, that it must come from elsewhere. And we can know at least one thing about how this elsewhere must be characterized. Using Wittgenstein's language, the world's existence can't originate from something in which how it is and that it is once again come apart. Why is it that your parents can't explain that you exist? Because they're just like you. Their existence is as unexplained as yours. That's the impasse, the, the difficulty, which the why question moves us to overcome. And so, the only possibility would seem to be this. The mystery of the world's existence must originate in something that definitively overcomes the duality of how and that. This is what's pointed to if we allow our wonder at the world's existence fully to unfold. If we do, we find that it must originate in something in which how it is and that it is do not diverge. In other words, and in more classical language, we're drawn to affirm something in which essence and existence cannot be separated. And this is precisely what we call God. Now, there's something about this conclusion I want immediately to emphasize. When we are drawn in this way to affirm the existence of God, we aren't in any very recognizable way offering an explanation. Explanations typically use something we know uh, to shed light on something we don't. Here, that pattern is reversed. Something we know, the existence of the world, leads us to something we don't, the existence of God. Now, in saying that the existence of God isn't something we know, I obviously don't mean that we can't affirm it. I am affirming it. I mean that we can't understand it. God, a being in which essence and existence cannot be separated, is entirely beyond our power to penetrate. Affirming God's existence is unavoidable, but in doing so, we are affirming the existence of something incomprehensible to us. In this moment, we think what we cannot understand. The existence of God proves to be a kind of demonstrated unknowability. If this is a kind of explanation, it's not one which justifies any claim to mastery or to closure. It's a kind of recognition of what lies mysteriously beyond us. I would say it's the necessary horizon of free thinking. Inescapable? 
well, obviously not, strictly speaking. The desire to stay securely within the boundaries of what can be mastered is, after all, very strong. So, we might try saying, as Bertrand Russell tried saying on a famous occasion, that although the existence of the world is indeed mysterious, we have simply to accept it as a brute fact beyond which we cannot go. That would be a kind of escape. But if cannot go means will not go, then our escape is at the cost of being arbitrary, in fact, closed or defensive, dare one say it, repressed. The existence of God, by contrast, is an explanation that leads into the unknown, an answer that shapes itself as a question, or rather, as several questions. Who is God? Why give the world existence? What does it mean to recognize that the world and we ourselves receive existence? rather than possess it. Philosophy's affirmation of the existence of God deepens not mastery, but mystery, the focused, irreversible persistence of wonder. And such wonder is as far as we can go when tonight our context is reason, not faith. Some on my side of this debate would dispute that. <clears throat> they would claim that over and above affirming God as the mysterious origin of the world's existence, philosophy can attain a richer conception of the divine in terms of attributes such as omnipotence, omniscience, supreme goodness, and so on. The arguments are interesting, but I have my doubts, both about how much philosophy can achieve in this area and also about the usefulness of what it might attempt. In my view, these questions are more religious than philosophical. What is meant specifically by calling God all-powerful or all-knowing or all-good can, in my opinion, be properly elucidated only in the context of faith. Well, what is faith? It draws on the questions we ask, but above all, it's about the answers we receive. And according to faith, these answers are God's answers. Such answers constitute determinate systematic beliefs and practices which are said to come from God and also to lead to God what we call religion. Above all, in ways which definitively surpass all philosophical speculation, faith tells us who God is. Now, atheism, the affirmation of God's non-existence, is philosophically unreasonable in light of the very being of the world. But when we consider not the existence of the world, but what the world is like, atheism might not appear so unreasonable after all at least as a practical stance. Given the world as we know it, the supposedly all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good God can certainly seem enigmatic, ambivalent, or even hostile towards us. And if God appears to have abandoned us, why shouldn't we abandon God? Atheism at least sometimes originates, I think, in this way, and I don't find its reactions unintelligible. But this is where what religion rather than philosophy tells us of God can make a decisive difference. My last point. I'd like to end by suggesting that the depth of Christianity, and the most important of the signs that it is true, lies in its capacity to make redemptive sense even of the experience of seeming to be abandoned by God. And since we are taking part in the first Chesterton debate, it seems appropriate to make this concluding point by recording something Chesterton himself wrote as follows. When the world shook and the sun was wiped out of heaven, it was not at the crucifixion, but at the cry from the cross, the cry which confessed that God was forsaken by God. Let the atheists themselves, Chesterton wrote, choose a God. They will find only one divinity who ever uttered their isolation, only one religion in which God himself seemed, for an instant, to be an atheist. Catholic Archdiocese of Toronto and the Office of Catholic Youth for a lot of work that they put in to make this new Chesterton debate series get off the ground.
I understand our event is the first in this series, and I'm very honored to have been invited to participate today. I also want to thank Father Cleveley for joining me and for his opening remarks, and to all of you for your interest in this important topic. It's really great to be here with you. I'm going to start by telling you what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. What I'm not going to do is provide a proof that demonstrates the non-existence of God. Proofs belong to the domain of mathematics and to the purely logical manipulation of basic axioms. I'm also not going to argue that God, that no God exists. This positive assertion or knowledge claim would carry with it a burden of proof. So instead, I'll be defending the broadest and most general conception of atheism, a sort of minimum position for atheists. I will argue that I do not believe in any God. There's another context in which we talk about burdens of proof, and that is the court of law. In our legal system, it's the job of the prosecution to make the case that the defendant is guilty, that the suspect did it, beyond a reasonable doubt. The job of the defense isn't to prove the suspect's innocence, but rather to show the prosecutor's case fails. That is why juries return a verdict of guilty or not guilty, rather than guilty or innocent. Likewise, the advocate for God must make the case that, when it comes to creation, God did it. My job is to show why that case fails, and fails well beyond a reasonable doubt. I intend to show why the case for God fails by refuting the major arguments for theism, which should be sufficient to defend the position I'm staking. But I have a feeling you would let me get away without also putting forward separate reasons to doubt the existence of God, so let me start there. First, we have to agree what kind of God we're all here talking about. There are a few different ways to show something doesn't exist, and it depends a great deal on what that something is. One way to show something doesn't exist is to show the very idea of the thing literally makes no sense. For example, a round square. This approach may be sufficient to disprove the notion of certain conceptions of God, especially the classic but ill-defined concept of God as an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present, and all-good being. Consider the famous omnipotence paradox, which attempts to demonstrate the logical impossibility of an all-powerful entity. Such a being would be required to be capable of creating a task that it itself would be unable to perform. Such a being would be able to create creatures with free will, but would also be omniscient, and hence know what such creatures will do, thus simultaneously depriving them of free will. Another way to show something does not exist is to look very carefully for it. For some things and some conceptions of God, if you look as best you can and you still can't find it, it's reasonable to conclude it's not there. I think this applies to many traditional theistic conceptions of God, where God is expected to be alive and active in creation. Certainly it disproves the pagan gods of the Greeks and the Norse, but in fact the more God is invoked as an active presence in the world, the more that God is vulnerable. The so-called God of the gaps that is invoked to explain anything science temporarily cannot understand, how complex organisms emerged, how planets revolve in stable orbits, how protons stay together in the nucleus, is cast into doubt each time science inevitably fills those gaps. Now a final approach we can take to show something does not exist is to ask, what would we expect from a universe where such a God exists versus a universe where that God does not exist? and in which universe do we seem to find ourselves. I'm going to focus on this approach going forward, so let me apply that line of reasoning to a few considerations. First, consider the success of science. Invoking only natural causes has proven extraordinarily successful at explaining our world. There seems no reason to suppose this would have been the case a priori. If theism were true, we might expect God to act in the world in ways that science would have to take into account. An all-loving, powerful, an all-powerful agent seeking in the monotheistic tradition a loving relationship with creation would be a causal agent in the universe, and scientific accounts would have to incorporate his actions in some way. But science seems able to ignore God in its explanations for the universe. Second, consider the question, just where is God? We may not know if God exists, but we do know that debates about the existence of God exists. In fact, many of those debates exist. And the very fact that there are debates about the existence of God suggests there are reasonable grounds for unbelief. If this world were the creation of a supreme being who seeks a loving relationship with us, he could have ensured everyone who is capable of reciprocating this loving relationship would come to believe in him. But there is no persuasive evidence for all people. In fact, countless millions have sincerely sought God, could not find him. Several of the world's oldest and largest faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, 
have not come to the one true monotheistic faith. Some Eastern religions are even atheistic in their outlook. God could have given each of us a clear, inner, unmistakable awareness of his presence, still leaving us with the choice to accept his love or not. While there are, of course, responses to this argument, based on the God works in mysterious ways variety, the question is not can we explain away this hiddenness, but rather in which kind of universe would we expect or even predict to find God hidden? I would suggest that would be the atheistic one. Third, consider our growing understanding of the deep connection between minds and brains. Philosophers once thought mind to be grounded in some immaterial substance or soul, an approach called mind-body dualism. This led to the image of an eternal, immortal spirit inside our corruptible, mortal coil, a view that would require God. But a majority of neuroscientists now reject this picture. What they're seeing are specific correlations between mental phenomena and brain activity, which we would not expect if dualism were true. For example, specific cognitive abilities like language use and spatial reasoning can be selectively impaired by damage to specific areas of the brain responsible for their function. Dualism seems more likely given theism because theism is already committed to the existence of at least one immaterial mind, that would be God, conceived of often as a disembodied consciousness. The downfall of dualism does not prove that the soul does not exist, but the growing neuroscientific understanding that minds arise from purely physical processes in the brain and do not require an immaterial soul is again just what we would expect in an atheistic rather than a theistic universe. Fourth, let's consider the science of evolution. You know, creationists and intelligent design proponents, and even those known as theistic evolutionists who accept evolution but see God's hand directing the process, they often make some version of the argument from design, seeing evidence of human-like design or purpose in nature. But when designers design, they first create a blueprint for what they deem the most efficient design, and then they go ahead and build that. Evolution by natural selection is the exact opposite process. There are no blueprints for species. Instead, nature creates everything and then discards any errors. It's like an engineer building a bridge by trying every combination until one finally stays up. That's not design. Instead, evolution must make gradual changes to pre-existing structures, leaving organisms like us with traits that are functionally useless or even dysfunctional. Of course, we're, we're lucky, we're still here at least. Almost every single species that has ever existed on this earth has gone extinct. In the astronomical domain, we see the same kind of waste, with billions upon billions of stars and galaxies hosting countless worlds, the vast majority unlikely to hold life. A gratuitously wasteful, inefficient, and highly imperfect cosmological and evolutionary process to bring about complex species is much more likely on the, on the assumption of a blind causal mechanism at work with no mind and limited powers rather than as an instrument of an all-powerful, rational intelligence. Fifth, consider suffering. Every day, children are attacked by preventable diseases like malaria, which kills over one million children a year. Now, when a terrorist attacks innocent people, we justifiably consider them evil for committing suffering to innocence, regardless of their motives. So what are we to say about a god that allows suffering? One often hears that there must be a higher good created or evil prevented. Take the recent typhoon in the Philippines, though, which killed 4,000 people. Some will point to the world's positive response to this tragedy to offer God a defense. But that would suppose that God uses the suffering and death of innocence so as to grow and educate others. According to this crass utilitarian argument, we're not created in God's image, imbued with individual dignity and rights. No, we're merely playthings to be manipulated by God. Others will argue God's reasons are beyond human understanding, but we can take solace, at least, in knowing that the explanation must have something to do with God's love for us. Now, the implied inconsistency of those preceding two statements notwithstanding, why should God's reasons for allowing suffering be mysterious? A loving father will try to explain to a child why they are suffering. Neuroscientist and author Sam Harris has a good response to this argument, that despite untold suffering, this is the best possible world which in the fullness of time and God's grand plan maximizes goodness and happiness. The problem, he says, is that it's equally conceivable to imagine the opposite being true, that the universe is in fact the creation of an all evil agent, which allows for the existence of some goodness, only so as to in the fullness of time maximize all suffering. 
The point isn't that one or the other is likely, but that both seem consistent with the actual universe in which we live. In other words, not assuming at the outset either an all-powerful good or evil being, we see a universe that appears just as it would if there were neither, if it were, as Richard Dawkins puts it, merely pitiless and indifferent. Sixth, consider history and geography. Religious ideas do have a history, and they develop in time along with environmental and technological factors. When city-states first emerge, gods transform from animistic spirits embodying the earth and the sky to become personified sources of divine authority and law, legitimizing the rule of emerging chiefs. When writing was invented, religion transformed from something you do through rituals and ceremonies to something codified you believe. Purely natural and secular factors had an intimate effect on the kind of religion and the kind of God favored by particular groups as they related to their utility and survival value. And if religion has a history, it also clearly has a geography. An individual's religion, and hence their beliefs about God, can be guessed with good accuracy simply by knowing where in the world they happen to live, and with great accuracy by knowing the beliefs of their parents. As with previous arguments, neither the historical nor the geographical considerations of religion prove God doesn't exist. Among the many conceptions of God our species has explored through time and space, there could of course be one that's correct. But we are considering which universe we more likely live in without a priori assumptions, pardon me. The excellent fit between material, environmental, and technological factors on the one hand, and conceptions of God on the other, is what we would expect in an atheistic universe in which God played at no actual role in human history at all. And finally, consider that the total energy of our universe is zero. When you add the positive energy of contained in all the matter in the universe to the negative energy contained in the force of gravity holding that matter together, you get precisely zero. Any other number would be suspicious, but zero is what you would expect if the universe came from nothing. I believe the preceding arguments reinforce each other to build a body of doubt which taken as a whole makes atheism the more reasonable conclusion. Now in responding as I will later to Father Cleveley's remarks and to your questions, I want to do something a little bit daring, and I want to concede at the outset that the project of providing a purely naturalistic explanation for the universe has its challenges, I readily admit to that. As the biophysics trained theologian Alistair McGrath wrote in his book The Dawkins Delusion, every worldview, whether religious or not, has its point of vulnerability. We don't yet know how life began. We don't yet have a physical theory to unite the two great pillars of 20th century physics, general relativity and quantum mechanics. As such, we don't yet have a satisfying answer to why the universe has the laws it has or why there even is a universe. But let's put these concessions into context. We are making progress in each of these areas by employing the scientific process and without requiring recourse to supernatural beings. Big questions formerly thought impossible for science to explain, are now coming to be well understood. Only a few decades ago, for example, physicists were perplexed by the mystery of why the universe should appear homogeneous on the largest scales, when information would at no point in the universe's history have had enough time to travel from one side of the universe to the other. A theory that goes beyond the Big Bang, a theory known as inflation, now resolves a number of these cosmological paradoxes. Inflation posits a period of rapid, exponential expansion in the very early universe, making the universe much bigger than we can imagine. And its startling predictions have been demonstrated by studying the variations in the cosmic microwave background, radiation left over from the earliest moments of the universe. Now what's interesting is that in many models, inflation is eternal, and baby universes continue to grow out of their parents. Inflation, it turns out, very likely leads to a multiverse, in which universes can differ in laws of nature and physical constants. If, ex if existence takes the form of a multiverse, and there are other ideas in physics to support this, some admittedly more speculative than others, we would have one answer to the so-called fine-tuning of our own universe for life. I wanted to go into detail on this for a reason. I think it's important to be honest about our challenges at the frontiers of science. But I also wanted to give some taste for the excitement and progress being made by physicists and other scientists to expand our knowledge and understanding into areas we never dreamt we as a species could go. Please also keep in mind that the challenges facing science and the naturalistic account in no way make the case for God. Simply pointing to the current failures of one paradigm to explain something in no way provides evidence that a competing paradigm can explain that thing. 
Instead, the addition of God into the picture creates yet another element requiring explanation, both to account for God's existence, as well as to explain the mechanism by which such an agent, existing outside of space and time, can have any effect whatsoever in our world. But we'll get to that soon. Thank you very much. for your remarks um, found them very interesting and insightful. So my first question is, uh, you argue that, quote, the existence of everything which the world comprises manifests a radical otherness. Uh, it is an otherness that no idea of the world can encompass and nothing internal to the world can explain. This otherness must originate in something itself wholly other, and this is what we call God. That was towards the beginning of your remarks and then much of your, uh, your comments were to, uh, to buttress that point. So my question is that if God, so described, is defined as otherness par excellence, then how can such a being have any effect or influence whatsoever inside our world? And if such a being does have an effect or influence within our world, does such a being not then cease to qualify as the kind of being of pure otherness upon which your argument for the existence of God appears to be premised? Well, thank you, um, Justin. Those of you with very good memory will um, realize that the words that Justin quoted as mine didn't appear in, in the text that I read this evening. He was quoting quite properly from an earlier version of my remarks, which um, we, we exchanged um, a few weeks ago. Uh, not that I want to um, retract anything that I said. Um, <laughs> in, in those remarks, which, which Justin correctly attributes to me. Well, um, this, is, this is a question which Justin insists on at various points in his own remarks. Um, how could a God who was in some sense transcendent of the world um, have any effect upon it? Um, and if it couldn't have any effect upon it, then what is the point in positing it? Conversely, if it can have an effect upon it, um, Justin asks, in that case, would its transcendence of the world not be compromised? Um, and I think that those two points can be met. Um, the first question about uh, whether a transcendent origin of the being of the world um, could have any effect in the world, that, that seems to me to be based on the idea that God should have an effect in the world of a kind that would show up, for example, in scientific. At one point in his, in his own remarks, Justin commits himself to the view that, that if God exists, then we would expect that science would have to make room for theistic type of explanations in the domain of scientific explanation, as if the very phenomena to which science directs itself would have, as it were, places or, or um, moments in which God would have to be introduced. That seems to me to be just an assumption. And, 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 and in fact, not a very good one. I mean, the integrity of science, indeed the integrity of the, the world which science studies, seems to me to demand that it has a certain autonomy, a certain real um, uh, nature, or in fact, uh, complex interaction of natures, um, all of which, once they exist, once they are given being, um, operate um, according to those and according to the principles and agencies which are enshrined in them. So I don't think that we should be looking for particular God effects in the world, unless we're talking about the specific domain of miracles, which I think is not just in what you want to focus on. I mean, we, we can talk about miracles, but which are by definition moments of purely supernatural intervention in an otherwise integral natural order. But if it's not the question of the miraculous that we're dealing with, then I, I think that the integrity of, of, of a natural order and the integrity of scientific explanation does not require um, theistic moments um, in order to reassure us that, that um, God is active in the world. Um, and then as to the second point, would the transcendence of God be compromised um, if um, God did have such agency or was manifested in such moments. Well, I think that he is not manifested in such moments, so in one sense for me the question doesn't arise. But, but is he compromised, for example, by being the transcendent ground 
of the existence of the world? I don't think so. There is, in fact, um, in classical philosophical theology, uh, a complex dialectic of transcendence and immanence, as it is called. That is to say, the way in which God is um, in, in excess of all created categories, but is also um, uh, closer to the beings that he has created, even than they are to themselves. Now, this kind of language may just state it so boldly seem, seem rather poetic. Um, in fact, a very, a very rigorous um, um, reflection upon the way in which God as the origin of the world and God as the, as it were, the heart of the world or the center of the world um, underlies it. So we could talk further about transcendence and immanence, but, but I, for the moment, that's as much as I want to say. Well, as much as you want to say in response, but can you have a question now? Uh, yes. The project. Um, well, um, thank you, Justin, for your remarks, um, which were interesting. Um, <laughs> How are you speaking? Um, and, and, and in interesting and in, in, in important ways, and, and because I mean, I mean, philosophy gets interesting, I think, when it, when it raises important questions and, and, and forces things to view. So what, one of the things that I think was forced to view by what you said is this. You speak of things science temporarily does not understand. And later on, you give examples. You admit that science doesn't yet have a satisfying answer to why the universe has the laws it has. That was your first example. Or why there even is a universe. That was your second example. Now, these two questions, it seems to me, correspond exactly to my distinction between how things are and that they are. And I have argued that these are radically different questions. Explaining how the world is always presupposes that the world exists whereas explaining that it exists requires you to presuppose precisely nothing and to generate your explanation from there. Question, Father. So, <laughs> you evidently disagree that, that these are radically different questions. So, my question is this. How would you go about defending the possibility of scientific explanation from nothing? Okay, so I think there's two challenges sort of wrapped up there. Uh, one, uh, why is there something rather than nothing? And two, how can an atheistic world be intelligible? So I'm gonna tackle the second uh, challenge a bit later when I think in your third question, I believe uh, you asked me that more directly. Uh, but first of all, uh, let me tackle for now uh, the question about uh, something rather than nothing, which seems untackleable. Uh, and I want, to, I want to start by acknowledging, uh, I hope we can acknowledge, this is a challenge really to both of us. I mean, you think your argument is that because the world is, is God must exist, just in that, in that existence of the world um, is to be found the, the rational justification for God's existence. But I think that argument also presupposes the existence of the world. I also see it as signaling another retreat for the God of the gaps, who seems to live on in an increasingly shrinking patch of real estate. Uh, science uh, came to explain how the world operates. God was forced to retreat to ever smaller places, uh, no longer necessary to explain why the planets revolve or why or how things evolve. Uh, God came to hide, if you'll allow me to get poetic for a moment, between quarks and in the shadowy moments before the Big Bang. Always in the hope that God would be just out of reach of scientific explanations. God hid himself so perfectly from creation, leaving no trace, no evidence of his existence, he, in fact, became indiscernible from a non-existent God. Now, as a result of this reality, I think the next retreat is on. God is now to abandon any role whatsoever in the functioning of the natural world. He's no longer even to be the first cause of the universe, as that is now also on shaky ground. Just when there seemed nowhere else for God to go, he was brought in as a philosophical concept, now to stand in for the why of the universe. Finally, a place for God was found that appears to be safe, as it is by definition unfalsifiable. Now, to return to my courtroom analogy, the new conception of God as simply the why or the is of the universe, it's kind of like saying that the motive is sufficient evidence for the crime. If creation was a crime, as the jury's out on that, we have no evidence of who did it, of who did this crime, and suggesting a motive would not be sufficient for a conviction. There are infinite possible whys, and the only way to determine between them is by looking at the how. I think we're inevitably back at the how. 
And the evidence science is finding in how the world exists is contradicting the traditional Christian, and I would say, other religious propositions for why the world exists. Now, I already conceded again, as you said, that why there is something rather than nothing is a difficult problem. It's maybe the most difficult problem. Although I don't see theism as offering any solution at all, or even having a perch in which to confront this problem. Science leaves up, at least offers some hope of getting us there, almost done. <laughs> it's true that science does not yet have a fully satisfying answer, uh, but some of humanity's brightest lights are dedicating their lives to looking at that question. Today there are many ideas about getting universes out of the void of nothingness from quantum fluctuations to multiverses of parallel dimensions. I think though there are some things that we can know. We can know by evolution that complexity can arise naturally from very basic building blocks, an idea that is applicable beyond merely the biological domain. In physics, there are now theories where space and time emerge from something even simpler, vibrating strings, for example. On the other hand, perhaps we're wrong to presuppose that there was ever nothing. As the concept of time is meaningless without stuff, this stuff could have always existed. There never needed to have been nothing. Not to skip over this example, because I'm going to go over time here. Anyways, I think that there are theoretical and experimental approaches in science that can start to grapple with this very, very big conundrum. But yes, currently we just don't know. I think the ability to admit that is a hallmark, one of the greatest strengths of the scientific approach. I don't know, peaks curiosity provides potentially fruitful avenues of inquiry that leads to breakthroughs in human knowledge and understanding. All our knowledge of the universe we inhabit has come through honest scientific endeavor, with every contribution subject to revision, criticism, and verification. And one day, perhaps soon, we'll have more ideas about why there's something rather than nothing. But as I admitted before, it's a challenge, I think, to both of our worldviews, to all worldviews. OK, thank you, Justin. And I'm sure that you have a fruitful avenue of inquiry, to paraphrase you, for uh, Father Cleveland next. Yes, so this is uh, kind of a two-part question. Um, you, uh, you began your remarks uh, by uh, uh, asking us to acknowledge that uh, we think we know what the idea of God amounts to, um, but uh, those assumptions perhaps uh, needed to be uh, clarified. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I'm, I'm still not exactly sure what your idea of God amounts to. And I'm not sure if you mean by God as simply, as, I wonder if you mean by God simply the ground of being, or as sort of a more anthropomorphic agent in the world. I mean, you, you've referred to, mostly to the more philosophical conceptions of God, but you did uh, towards the end, at least, in, in some of your quotes, reference uh, the Christian religion. So I want to ask you two questions. These will be my questions two and three. Mm -hmm. that first relate to the first conception of God, if it's the more ground of being conception. And then a second question that relates to that more anthropomorphic or Christian conception of God. So may I I'll ask the first part of that two-parter? Um, he, he can fill eight minutes, I'm sure. That's all you know. I won't in my question, I promise. So if, if your God is something like the ground of being, then it would be self-contradictory and incoherent for me to argue against the existence of such a God, um, just as it would be ridiculous to argue against a God to find his truth while simultaneously making a case for truth. But the other side of the coin is that such a God has no substantial meaning or testability. Okay, so if God is the ground of being and existence, is the kind of God you mean? My question is, in what ways would the world change if your God did not exist? or if we actually did in fact live in a kind of representation of the world that you described, without that otherness being there, as you put it. Your thought experiment conceived of an absolutely perfect representation of the world, one that included absolutely everything. It would in fact be identical to what is in fact in our world, and to quote you, such a world would suffer no loss. So I'm curious, how does your God change anything about the actual world we live in? I want to warn you both that you're giving a bad example to the audience because if their questions are even a, a second as long as yours, we're going to be here till midnight. Father, thank you. Um, well, uh, um, uh, again, Justin was, was quite properly referring to uh, what I call a thought experiment in, in, in an earlier version of the paper, the same version in which he quoted in his first question to me. Um, and um, to reconstruct what the thought experiment was, I think my be tedious, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to try and just address directly what, what Justin asked, which as far as I can see is, is this. What difference is made by the grand being? Well, that's like asking the question, what difference is made by being? 
The difference that's made is that things exist, that they are not just ideas or possibilities, that the world is not just a possible world, it's an actual world. And the argument concerning otherness that I've made is an argument that in excess of possibility, of idea, there has to be, for reality, something other, which is existence. And that this never, in principle, can never flow from what something is in the world. What something is, despite what Justin was trying to persuade us of in his last answer, um, will never give you why. Justin, I think, is more optimistic than I am about the possibility of explanation from nothing. Um, simplicity is not nothing. Uh, reduced complexity is not nothing. Uh, very basic and fundamental laws are not nothing. Um, it, there seems to me to be not just a contingent difficulty about explaining the world from nothing, but an absolute and in principle one. The difference then that is made by the ground of being um, is the difference of real existence. Why there is something rather than nothing. Now, how do you estimate that difference? It's as incalculable and as momentous as you like. Um, it seems to me, in fact, and I don't wish to be merely facile, but if, if Justin acknowledges, as he does in his question, that it would be self-contradictory and incoherent to argue against the existence of a God who is the ground of being, then I fear he's conceded my argument. I agree it is self-contradictory and incoherent to argue that the world which exists does not exist. And it's precisely the existence of the world and God as the ground of that existence for which I've been contending. So I'm, I'm struggling to see why you don't think you've made a larger concession than you have. If I've conceded your argument, you have to first explain to me what the argument is, because I'm still not getting it. Oh, well, I, 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 think, I think you've um, acknowledged that you understand the argument by saying that it would be self-contradictory or incoherent to argue against it. Against truth. So, I mean, um, so what remains of your opposition? We have another hour to go. <laughs> was that your third question? That was the second question. <laughs> um, all the difference in the world is the answer to Justin's question. Or rather, all the difference that is. Okay, Father, now, um, you have a question. So the majority of your arguments, Justin, it seems to me, take the form of claiming that the existence of God is unlikely if we look at the world as it is, and in your words, make no prior assumptions. Well, I think you do make a prior assumption. Um, it's the prior assumption that the world exists. Um, but I want to leave that aside for the moment because it's the main topic of, of, of my argument, and, and concentrate more on your own. Um, you also make assumptions, it seems to me, in your descriptions of how the world is. Um, and several of these descriptions incorporate moral judgments. For example, when a terrorist attacks innocent people, we justifiably consider the terrorist evil. You evidently consider that allowing people to suffer is something that requires ethical justification. Our dignity and rights as human beings entitle us not to be subject to utilitarian manipulation by others. I'm drawing more or less exactly from your text. Now, of course, I don't necessarily disagree with these claims, but I'm interested in the assumption that you make that such claims make sense and can be justified, given the kind of universe you say you believe in. So, my question is, how can you explain the kind of ethical claims you make? How can you vindicate those claims? In a universe, and this is the precise point, governed, you say, by causal mechanisms that you believe are blind 
pitiless and indifferent. Okay, so I think what you're asking is basically how can objective morality exist without God? Now, first I want to suggest that that is a separate debate from whether God exists. And my point, and you re re refer to it uh, in your question that I made in my comments, was to observe that there does exist suffering and acts of cruelty, the, mag the magnitude of which are more consistent in my point of view with an atheistic universe. Now, when I made that argument, I didn't need to prove that the morality or immorality of an act exists apart from sentient creatures, which is the question of objective morals. I didn't need to show that, for example, murder would still be wrong even if there was no one to murder. That may or may not be true, but I can take it as a given that, in fact, we do live in a universe where there are entities capable of pain and suffering, and that this is something conscious beings do not like, but which God appears to allow. That observation is enough without establishing the human independence of morality, or the independence of morality from human existence, to suggest that God does not exist or that the universe appears as though God does not exist. But I will go further. Um, I want to ask how a God makes a difference in terms of giving us moral worth. How does a God just decide that we have moral value? God doesn't just decide we have moral value. Uh, we don't suppose God could decide that a brick is as valuable as a person. Rather, it must be that God recognizes something about us that is morally important. Maybe our capacity to suffer, our desire to flourish, our ability to become aware about ourselves and our world. But if there are intrinsic reasons for that moral worth, then God falls out of the picture. And it's these morally important features that make the difference. In fact, I think it is precisely because there is no sentient, powerful, higher being that cares about my personal well-being that my moral choices are important. It's precisely because the universe is governed by blind, pitiless, and indifferent forces that it's imperative that we act in a way to increase the general well-being of our family, our community, our country, and our species, and our world. No one else will do it. If we make the choice to kill each other through warfare or poisoning our planet, there's no force preventing our extinction. No fate, destiny, universal plan, or guarantee that things will turn out a certain way. This is why our decisions and our actions matter. They are only the way they are the only way we can change our world for the better. Atheists demand that we take responsibility for our impact on society because our sole legacy is the world that we leave behind us. What could possibly be more moral than that? Now, the idea of the existence of God as a source of moral direction simply, I think, illuminates the, con the, human position on mor the humanist position on morality. Pardon me. Morality is only relevant in the presence of consciousness. We have consciousness and awareness of the consequences of our actions. Therefore, the harm or well-being we cause others has moral implications. A significant part of our moral understanding as conscious beings is that we are responsible for our actions to the, to the degree that we have ability to affect others in a positive or a negative way. It could be argued that a being who had ultimate ability to affect the world, or who is the world, would also have ultimate responsibility for both the good and the evil that we encounter. Nor does God in itself offer a foundation for morality. On what authority is God to be taken as an authority? It can't be God's because it only begs the question. Nor can it be God's omnipotence, unless you just believe that super right makes super, super might makes super right. Damn, I screwed that up. <laughs> anyway, anyway, beings and morals cannot come from an external source, as then they are not your meaning or morals. They belong to someone or something else, God. All humans, unfortunately or fortunately, have the burden and the responsibility of discovering morals and searching for meaning. Can I say something? I, just, I, 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 quite, I quite explicitly left God out of it. I did not ask what the foundations of morality are apart from God. I asked what the foundations of morality are in a universe governed by blind, pitiless, and indifferent causal mechanisms. Now, I can't understand from your answer whether you think that human beings are part of such a universe or not. If they are part of such a universe, then they too are governed by causal mechanisms that are blind, pitiless, and indifferent. If they are not part of such a universe, then you owe us an explanation of how, within such a universe, human beings and moral responsibility could arise, quite independently of God. So your first question is, do I think humans are part of this universe? And well, but part of the universe you characterize as governed by causal mechanisms that are blind, pitiless, and indifferent. It's how within that causal mechanism, 
moral value can arise that, I, that I'm asking my question. No, nothing about God. Forget God. <laughs> okay, then I guess we both have the same challenge. God is God is God. Uh, okay, well, uh, I, I, I just, this is the question I'm asking, that's all. Okay, sure. No, that's fine. And if, and if God is out of the picture, and, and I kind of this goes back to a lot of my refrain here tonight, we both have challenges to understand where meaning comes from, where morals come from, why this universe rather why there is a universe rather than nothing. I think whether you're a theist or an atheist, we all share the the same challenges and conundrums of trying to understand those those paradoxes, frankly. Um, my best attempt at that, and I'm you know, not a scholar in this area, would be to say that, of course, humans are part of the universe. Of course, we evolved in the universe, and we are governed by the laws of physics and, and, uh, and, uh, and through evolutionary biology. Um, uh, we have emerged as a species that is capable of understanding our place in the universe, that has certain unique features in terms of consciousness, in terms of awareness, in terms of the, of the ability uh, to form plans, of the ability to suffer pain, of the ability to cause pain, and I think those unique features of human beings, though they're not in any way opposed or beyond the physical or the, the biological domain, or we're still bound by the laws of, of nature, mm. those unique features of human beings give them the ability to act morally and to discern moral truths. It's remarkable, isn't it? Yeah, it is remarkable. <laughs> Another thing we can agree on. It's very Okay, thank you both. first, so we will ask a question from the audience for Justin first to start off this round. And Justin. That's <laughs> <laughs> another question, but nothing. You know what? <laughs> Science and reason are not supposed to make presumptions on any knowledge claim. Yet your arguments seem to refute that on the basis you know what sort of universe he would make. How do you justify that, Justin? Can you read that again? <laughs> Why don't we do it together? <laughs> Science and reason are not supposed to make presumptions on any knowledge claim. Yet your arguments seem to refute that on the basis, okay? On the basis you know what sort of universe he would make. How do you justify that? Sure. Okay. Three minutes. Okay, well, I'll be brief on this one, if I can. Um, I, I don't think we're making presuppositions. Um, a lot of what I was talking about, uh, they, they're a methodology, okay? So science does have a methodology. Um, the methodology involves uh, inquiry, it involves um, uh, uh, naturalism, uh, but not philosophically, it's not committed to philosophical naturalism. It's possible that we could have uh, as I suggested in my remarks, discovered that in fact we lived in a universe where uh, mind and body uh, didn't connect so intimately, um, where uh, there was a need for a soul to explain how uh, the mind can come up with images or ideas, that there was no physical basis to explain that, for example. Uh, it's possible that we would have needed God to explain a number of things in let's say, the evolution of, of complex organisms. So I don't think we were necessarily committed at the outset uh, to finding no supernatural explanations. I mean, it's quite possible that at some point uh, there will be a time when we'll design a physical experiment and there will be no regularity behind the discovery that, that comes as a result of that. Uh, it just so happens that um, by uh, looking for natural explanations, um, uh, by being open to other kinds of explanations, we keep finding that there are laws of nature um, not always the kinds of laws we suspect. I mean, nobody suspected quantum mechanics. Nobody suspected that there would be aspects of reality um, where uh, things can pop in and out of existence uh, in the void of space. I mean, we know that that is actually how the universe works. Um, but in fact, that, that seems counterintuitive. So if we were committed to a sort of common sense view of reality, you know, we wouldn't have been able to find quantum mechanics. And yet, not only did we discover it, um, but it's now, you know, the, the best supported theory uh, to explain uh, uh, things at the, at the smallest scales. Of course, there are still things we don't understand, but the point is uh, science has been able to continue making progress uh, without having to necessarily presuppose uh, what it would find uh, at the outset. 
Thank you. And uh, the next question for Father Cleveland really flows from that. Do science and the concept of God oppose one another? Uh, no. Fine, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> in, in fact, it seems to me that it's, it's one of the merits of my argument that I can give extensive scope to what I mean, Justin rightly describes as the highly successful methodology of science, um, and extensive scope to the, the power of the explanations that science can generate. Um, and I, I wanted to insist throughout my remarks this evening that within the domain of um, what there is and how it works, science has, I think, a vast explanatory power. Um, I, I hope that I haven't seemed to be seeking arbitrarily to restrict the scope of scientific explanation. Um, my point is, is a philosophical one of, of principle. It's attempting to establish, uh, not in order to uh, limit science, but to understand what science does, and attempt to establish the limit of scientific explanation. What is it that scientific explanation must presuppose in order to be scientific explanation? What, in, in one language one might use, are the conditions of possibility, the very conditions of possibility for scientific explanation? Now, my contention is that those limits can be discerned, not um, in a contingent and temporary way, sometimes implied, as if the thing were limitlessly open-ended. I think we can see, quite fundamentally, that science must presuppose that it has an object. There must be something for science to begin to explain anything. That is why I've argued that only on the assumption of existence is science um, um, uh, as powerful as Justin rightly commends it as being. And this is a limit which science is not apt to be able to deal with. There would have to be a science of nothing. That is to say, a science which, which could explain from the presupposition of nothing why anything is. And, and it seems to me just obvious that that's impossible. Thank you, Father. Just. The people that are asking you questions are the worst handwriters. <laughs> <laughs> the questions are good, I'm sorry to read. Um, no offense, you never listen. Um, Justin, why did you seem to dismiss the notion that God as the ground of being provide a substantive answer to this debate? Wouldn't knowing that God was a necessary being significantly change our perception of the world? Hmm. Well, I don't see how. I mean, first of all, the idea that God is a, the ground of, of rationality or a rational lawgiver. Um, not all religions, not all conceptions of God are committed to that. So we're here to debate, I guess, one particular kind of God. Um, my suggestion with that question, though, was, again, it was referring to a thought experiment that, that Father Cleveley provided in, in a version of his remarks. And there he asked us to compare the idea or the representation of existence or of the world with actual existence or the actual world. And what I was wondering is, if we just find ourselves in the world, then what is the, what is the difference or what changes if we take away the idea or the representation? It seems to me that we have to take it as a given that we're in the world. And the idea of the world, this kind of platonic notion of, of perfect ideas, that's, I think, a philosophically empty idea. There's no such thing as a perfect idea or a perfect representation. There only is the things that are in the world. Um, so everything is imminent or, or intrinsic or inside the world. Um, you can't really get a perch outside of the world. The role of science, I think, is to understand as much as possible from within the world, because that's where we're stuck. I don't think either of us can get outside of the world and have a sort of 
God's eye view on what the world would look like from outside. So, for example, um, it's wrong to think that if you're outside of existence, you have, you know, necessarily a better representation of existence, of the, the, uh, uh, the intrinsicness of, of, of what existence itself is like. Uh, take a cube, for example. If you're looking outside of a cube, uh, you can sort of, you, depending on your perspective, or even if you sort of go all around the cube, you can see the perimeter of the cube, you can see all the different faces of the cube, but you can't see necessarily what's inside the cube. So it's, it's being intrinsic to the universe that is where we happen to be, and that is the place where science is, is best, and it seems to me that that is all there is. And if that's all there is, then there's no, necessarily, no necessary limit on science being able to comprehend all of that. Thank you. Father Cleveland, it was a challenge. You repeatedly interchange the world and God. But it is obvious that the world exists, while it is not obvious that God exists. Is this therefore not a weak analogy? So, so what do I repeatedly do, sorry? <laughs> you repeatedly I'm, I'm always glad to know interchange what I, the world and God. I'm always glad to know what I repeatedly do. <laughs> um, I think, on the contrary, I, I repeatedly distinguish them. Um, I, the questioner asks why I repeatedly interchange the world and God. It's the whole direction of my argument that, that, that they are radically distinct um, beings. Um, the existence of the world is manifest to us. That doesn't mean, I think, that um, no conclusions can be drawn from the fact that the world exists. But obviously we don't have to prove that it does. Um, my argument for God is dependent upon um, the manifest existence of the world. But it doesn't confuse the manifest existence of the world with the existence of God. Rather it proposes that God is the, the necessary condition for the very existence of the world. Um, I think um, Justin exposes exactly the assumption that um, I wish to challenge. He, he said in his last answer, we have to take it for granted that we are in the world. We have to take it for granted that we are in the world. Um, I, I disagree. I don't think that we do have to take it for granted. Um, the attempt to close down what we might want to say when we do not take it for granted, when we ask, in other words, why are we in the world? Why is there anything of which we are part or in which we are? The attempt to just to close that down as a line of inquiry has no um, justification. My argument is that if you allow that question to remain open, there's only one answer. Thank you. Last uh, question for Justin from the audience. And this member of the audience, I think, is concerned for your salvation. <laughs> <laughs> what would have to happen in the world to change your perspective on God? <laughs> Thank you for your concern. <laughs> I have some concerns here tonight myself. Um, yeah, I mean, it really depends on the concept of God. I mean, I opened by explaining that dep depending on what kind of God you mean, there are different ways of, of, of approaching the question of does God exist. Um, if you are looking at a, a God who um, intervenes regularly, which I know neither of us are doing, but if you're talking about a very anthropomorphic God who, constantly involved in miracles and answering prayers and stuff like that. Um, perhaps, to take an extreme example, a, a god of the ancient um, a pagan world, um, then I think we all agree that that god doesn't exist um, and that there's, there's really no way to, to establish that such a god could exist other than, frankly, seeing something that is, that is clearly miraculous, a, a, a clear violation of the laws of nature. And that, that could happen. Uh, we could be in our labs one day um, and we could see something that is is at odds with the most fundamental understanding that we have about 
um, the theory of gravity or the theory of physics, uh, rather fundamental theories of physics, um, that at its core um, is inconsistent. But let's say that experiment showed us one thing which was inconsistent with something else at the same time. We know that that couldn't be, that that would have to be miraculous. So that, that could happen, but it doesn't happen. As I suggested earlier, we always see that there are regularities and, and the more we understand uh, the universe at its more fundamental level, those regularities uh, continue to persist. Um, so a god that's constantly intervening that would be necessary to explain the origin of complex organisms, for example, um, that, that's one thing. Um, then you have the more philosophical god that's sort of deistic, that's distant from us, that's defined um, sort of classically as omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent, um, <clears throat> etc. And I think that there my remarks would be, well, first you kind of have to show me how those constructs are even consistent. I offered some examples of how aspects of those three, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnibenevolent, come into logical conflict with each other. So first, you got to show me logically that it's an, even an idea that could make sense, then I'll sort of go and look for that. But really what I was trying to show with the bulk of my remarks here um, was that the weight of evidence, uh, if this was sort of a court of law, weighs heavily against the case for God. And so to the question, I am not here telling you that there is no God or that, that I know with certainty I could never be convinced of God, just simply that looking at the world as it actually is, you asked me sort of in the future, what could happen to convince you of God? But my remarks were looking at the world as it actually is, as we've seen from the history of our species, as we, uh, as we understand the physical world now through uh, the, the light of science and other rational approaches to understanding our universe. Um, the weight of evidence is uh, strongly against the, the theistic position that there is a God. So I think, um, I think I kind of have to refer back to the remarks that I made earlier. Thanks for the question. So you would be officially a skeptic as opposed to someone opposed? Y yeah, you know, sure. Somebody asked me during the intermission, um, we were talking about, about why we do these debates, um, why members, I suppose, of the, the atheist or skeptic community. And I, it's not really that I'm here to, to convert people to, to a position of non-belief in, in, uh, in God, um, even in the, the, the kind of atheism that I'm defending, which, which I suppose is not what we would call the strong atheist position. It's, it's not a, a, a position where I, as I said earlier, know that I can prove to you God doesn't exist. It really is, uh, thank you for using that word, it's a skeptic's position. I think it's a healthy skeptic's position to look for evidence, and if the evidence is lacking, and the burden of evidence, as I'm arguing, falls on the one making this, this extraordinary claim that one does conclude, uh, for now, until proven otherwise, uh, that we likely live in an atheistic universe. Father Cleveland, third and last question from the audience for you. How do we differ differentiate between a God that does not exist and a God that does not manifest himself in the real world? How do we differentiate between a God that does not exist and a God that does not manifest himself in the real world? Well, <clears throat> I mean, it all depends what you mean by manifest himself in the real world. I think that this question perhaps harks back to um, one of my early answers to a question that Justin put to me. Um, if by manifest himself in the real world, it means a God for whom there is absolutely no argument, either from how the world is or from that it is, then I would struggle to distinguish that from a non-existent God. Or at least I would struggle to distinguish it from a God for whom it made no sense to posit. Um, so I agree that in one way of interpreting the question, there would be no distinction, or at least the only a very subtle one. But it's not my claim that God does not at all manifest himself in the world. What I did claim was that he need not manifest himself in the world in that particular way that, 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 that Justin sometimes stresses. The God of the gaps, he calls it, the point at which scientific explanation breaks down in describing how the world um, I don't think that it necessarily does break down in describing how the world works. At least, it doesn't break down um, in describing how um, <coughs> non-rational substances work. 
um, there may be a problem about describing about scientific explanations relating to certain aspects of rationality. Uh, there may be a problem about scientific explanation in respect of certain aspects of moral truth. And, and Justin and I were um, honing in on those just before the break. But certainly in terms of natural substances, you know, what we would call nature now, I don't think there is um, any breakdown in scientific explanation in principle. And I wouldn't expect to see God as an, as, as an explanatory hypothesis uh, within science. But, but that is not to say that um, he does not manifest himself at all. Um, as I have um, argued, he manifests himself not, of course, um, uh, perceptually, and, and perhaps not even immediately, whatever that word might mean, but I think he manifests himself unmistakably as a certain kind of necessity um, or horizon of possibility for the very being of the world. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Justin. So now we're going into the last uh, part of the structure of this, uh, this evening. As, uh, as Matthew Sanders gave me my instructions. Um, and he said we have 30 minutes for the debaters to ask each other questions and uh, up to five minutes for them to, to, uh, to answer each other's questions. And so I asked you in this last session, you started off and I asked you the question from the audience. So uh, I'll allow you, Father Tibby, to pose a question to, uh, to Justin. Well, um, both Justin and I did have um, a, an extra question, as it were, left over from um, um, the exchanges that we had. Um, I just couldn't tell the difference between the questions and the answers sometimes. So no, that's, 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 that's because we were being very clever. But, but, no, but, no, but, 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 Justin, I'm only a lawyer. What do you want? <laughs> um, so let me ask that question, the one that I was going to ask Justin, um, and then we can take it, take it from there. Um, it's this. Um, it's, it's another question about the coherence of the, the kind of scientific or naturalistic worldview. Um, you see, very often in these discussions, the, 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 the coherence of the naturalistic or scientific worldview is, is simply assumed. And um, on one side, it's amazing explanatory advances are emphasized, and quite rightly. And then on the other hand, of course, a kind of due humility is expressed when certain major conceptual or philosophical difficulties with complete scientific explanation are raised. I think we saw one example of that in, in, in the case of morality. Um, another example would be this, arising from what Justin says about minds and brains. He claims minds arise from purely physical processes in the brain. And he says, rightly, I'm sure, that this expresses a neuroscientific consensus. Well, I don't think we should be too impressed by the neuroscientific consensus because um, the idea that the mental can, in a decisive way, be reduced to the physical is, is the very foundation of the neuroscientific research project. It, if, you, if you didn't accept that, you wouldn't be a neuroscientist, or at least. Um, probably find something else um, <clears throat> more adventurous to do. Um, uh, but um, among philosophers, there's nothing like a consensus that the mental is in principle reducible to the physical. Um, and one reason for that is this, that the relation between cause and effect, which pertains in the purely natural processes, which Justin says, um, at one level, is all there is to the world. The relationship between cause and effect in the physical world just doesn't seem to be the same kind of relation as exists between one thought and another. For example, the thoughts that Justin asks this evening, or that I utter. It's just a different kind of relation. So my question is whether Justin believes that everything he's said this evening so far, and everything he'll say when he answers the question in a moment, um, has been caused by some purely physical process in his brain. And if he does believe that, I wonder what reason he has for believing that anything he says is true. I 
That's another two questions. <laughs> I admit you, I admit you. Alright, right, now. Do you see my problem? <laughs> so, this is the question that I sort of foreshadowed earlier um, when I answered the first question. Um, it's about the intelligibility of an atheistic universe. Um, if mind is the emerging property of the brain, and thoughts are the results of merely physical processes, then I think you're asking, how can you say that any of them are true, or have confidence in them? First of all, you characterize neuroscientists as committed to reducing the mental to the physical. Neuroscience refers at base just to the study of the nervous system. It's an interdisciplinary field with incorporating chemistry, engineering, linguistics, computer science, physics, and psychology and philosophy. Various approaches are incorporated in neuroscience, including cellular studies of nerve cells, brain imaging to explore cognition and behavior, and studies of neural networks employing computer science insights. Out of this vast field of research has emerged a central understanding that the mental can explain, be explained by the physical. Now, as I said earlier, that these things needed to have been the case, and as I argued, in fact, it actually overturned the original commitment. We were committed to a paradigm. It wasn't this one, though. It was the mind-body dualism paradigm that held sway for a long time. But our minds clearly are the product of physical brains. One can understand this by studying deeply the structure of the brain. But one can also see that the mind is a product of the brain, not just looking at how the brain works, but when it doesn't work. When the brain is damaged through stroke, disease, surgery, or accident, the mind is affected. Depending on the nature of the injury, the mind can be affected through impaired memories, the inability to distinguish faces, waning language skills, or any other number of ways. We're only beginning to understand how the human brain works. Now, to your question, how can we have confidence in our minds? A big part of the answer is evolution. Evolution is not an accidental process because there are selective pressures at work. If we lived in a mental fantasy world with no relation to our physical environment, we would either become food for a predator or starve to death for lack of nutrients. We perceive with reasonable accuracy the world that we inhabit, with many fascinating flaws, foibles, and biases that are perfectly understandable only when viewed in the light of evolution. We do our best to correct for these mistakes in our mind's mental capacities because we've evolved to be just good enough to survive. But collectively, we are very good at overcoming these limitations. That's why today many of you arrive by subway, by car, or by bus. It's what allowed us to travel to the moon and communicate around the globe instantaneously, and to have increased the average human lifespan. Because the second part of the answer to this intelligibility question is methodology. We can test our beliefs against the actual world. And actually, to get back to your refutation to my earlier point, <coughs> that was complicated, I wasn't saying that we could only accept that the it world exists, that we live in the world and stop there, merely that that is at least a fact we can take for granted. And because we have that actual world there, we can sort of throw things against it and see if they bounce back. Sometimes the results of these tests lead us to change our beliefs. In testing the world, it could have turned out that there were no laws or patterns. In that case, science wouldn't have gotten very far, but the universe turned out to be rational. And so those basic tools of logic and reason, which came to us by way of evolution to keep us alive, can now be used to study the world. Now, you may be tempted to suggest that the rationality of the universe is what we'd expect from a rational God, but the rationality of the universe is also what you'd expect from a coherent universe that is capable of existing at all for more than a Planck second. The theistic argument that God explains rationality, I think, has serious vulnerabilities, which is probably why many religions never conceived of God in the image of a rational ground of being or lawgiver, as I said earlier. Here's the problem with that idea. To use God as a foundation for rationality or intelligibility rests on three premises. First, God is a rational agent. Second, the universe is rational. Third, that the rationality of the, uni of the universe can be connected to the rationality of God. But all of that is a rational argument. How do we know it's valid? We can't use rationality to tie it together because that's what we're trying to prove. If there is some philosophical conundrums with respect to the rationality and intelligibility of the universe, it seems to exist independent of the question of God. And to my earlier remark, and I hope it's becoming a theme because I think it's a good one, we all share these tough philosophical questions. And the more distant the God is, and I think Father Cleveley's God is extremely distant, uh, the more God cannot be invoked to have a difference in terms of answering these questions, the more we're sort of all in it together to find other answers. Um, can I come back? 
to respond? Yes, yes. Because, you know, well, oh. that was an answer, there was a challenge, oh. particularly at the end. Right. So we'll count that as a question. See, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, it's true, I think, that giving an explanation of how rationality works <clears throat> would involve the criterion of testability, um, which Justin uh, rightly drew our attention to. Um, it's true that it might be the case that rationality has some has been shaped in some way by by facing raw evolutionary dangers, um, which create a, a, an adaptability to a truth sensitive um, perception of the world. So I, I I think that that can only be a very minimal kind of explanation of rationality. I'm not sure what raw evolutionary dangers our performances here tonight help us to avoid. Um, but my point was more fundamental. My point is that physical things cause other physical things without regard to truth. It's not a truth-bearing relation when one physical thing causes another. Um, I can give you an explanation of why one billiard ball strikes another at a particular trajectory, when hit by a cue on a particular surface, and why it travels in a particular direction, and why it ends up in the pocket if it does. Those are physical processes caused perfectly respectably by causes in the physical world. They are causes and effects which are entirely naturalistic. Now, my question is, how on earth, upon such a causal framework, could truth ever supervene? How could the truthfulness of propositions or thoughts ever be connected uh, by such purely physical processes? Oh, is that a, that was a question. Was <laughs> a different question, but I guess we'll get to that. Um, so, I'll be allowed just to explain. Absolutely, I mean, this is the best part. Go back and forth. <laughs> um, well, I, I think I already, I feel like I just answered that question. I mean, I don't see any reason. So I think there's kind of a fallacy um, which says that the, the origin, um, uh, in the case of, let's say, morality or, or reason or intelligibility, that, that the origin of how we as humans uh, came to be reasonable creatures or or creatures with, with a moral understanding, that because that origin came from a natural process like evolution, that therefore that can't in itself validate it. And that's true, but it also doesn't necessarily invalidate it. So the fact that rationality is something that we evolved as a species uh, to enjoy for very good reasons of survival, it doesn't necessarily mean that that rationality can't be trusted. And I use the example that we have these tools of rationality, however we got them, and we don't just take it, therefore, as a given that they are to be fully trusted. We go out and we actually do experiments, we actually measure things, and we do find these patterns. And I gave some examples where we've actually overturned dogmas we were committed to, mind-body dualism dogma, the idea of classical mechanics, we discovered quantum mechanics. So it seems like we have the ability to get beyond our presuppositions through these tools of, of reason and, and logic, which, which did come by way of a natural process like evolution. But I don't necessarily see that that invalidates them. I mean, a great deal of what Justin has just said I agree with. It's just that it seems to me that his argument does have a pattern. And, it, and it's the same pattern that, that, that we see elsewhere in, in, in his arguments tonight. It's that we just have to take it for granted that physical processes, in some way that there is a serious difficulty about understanding conceptually, um, can bear mental properties, truth-bearing properties. And then, of course, if we make that assumption, then we can proceed in all the kinds of ways that Justin describes, testability, evolutionary theory, um, sociobiology, to explain rationality and how it works. And a lot of those theories are very interesting and good ones. But just as Ju Justin is making a fundamental assumption to get the whole thing going in, in the domain of the origins of rationality, so I think he makes a fundamental assumption to get the whole thing going in, in the domain of the existence of the world itself. It's all about not asking certain questions or not facing certain conceptual difficulties. 
in order that the exhilaration of doing a certain kind of science or a certain kind of theorizing can get off the ground. And it is exhilarating. It's, um, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But um, I don't think that that excitement and potential that scientific or naturalizing explanations have should blind us to the fact that there are limits in principle to what it can do. Well, I do want to push back on that because I, I, I do disagree completely with the idea that I would, I would close down doors of inquiry. Um, I, want to, I want to maybe uh, ask you uh, if you could provide um, a non-circular justification for how in your conception of God that breaks us out of this conundrum of trying to understand the origin of rationality. In my remarks, I gave the example that your logic requires that we can conclude that the universe is rational, that we can conclude that God is rational, and that we can make a rational argument based on all of that to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. All of that's rational. Everything you say, just as everything I say, presupposes some logic and reason for us to even be here debating. So, you know, you can challenge me with these questions, and I'm doing my very best. And, I, and perhaps, I, uh, perhaps there are people who are more uh, scholarly and philosophically inclined and, and could explain this better, but I'm not sure that you're really getting any further than I am in terms of both of us trying to tackle these very complex questions. Well, good, thank you, that, that, that's helpful. I mean, <clears throat> again, as in my morality argument, um, I wasn't claiming that God somehow explains rationality um, any more than I was explaining that God somehow explains morality. I mean, those are very complex arguments, I, I, I grant you. What I am trying to do is to, is to is to deflate a certain kind of scientific confidence. What I am trying to do is to bring up, um, I, I, I think, permanent conceptual difficulties in supposing that science can ever offer total explanations of phenomena. Now, whether the, the, the difficulty that science has here, the, the limiting principle that science has, leads you directly to God is, is another question entirely. And I, I haven't this evening advanced arguments from morality or from the existence of rationality for the existence of God. And I, I think they would be very complicated arguments. Um, um, I, I, I chose what I think is a, is a much simpler and more decisive argument from existence itself. Um, but what, what I'm strategically interested in is just showing that um, science has um, not just a kind of um, um, temporary difficulty but that we, we need to think seriously about what kind of thing science is and what the limits of its explanatory capacities are. And because we are being invited to suppose that the whole of whatever needs to be explained is in principle susceptible to scientific explanation. That's the underlying claim. That there is nothing else that needs to be invoked as an, ex as an explanatory datum or as an explanatory procedure than what the natural sciences can contain. Now, I think that there are serious difficulties with that regarding morality and serious difficulties regarding um, rationality. Um, and my aim is just to unsettle the assumption that science will one day explain everything. I've offered an argument, which I think is, 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 is a powerful one, why, why it cannot in principle do that with respect to the existence of the world, the very existence of um, and I've suggested that God, that God does, in that case, um, resolve the, the, the paradox that we face. Um, whether God in any direct way resolves the paradox of rationality or the paradoxes of morality is a, is a, is a very difficult question. Um, but, but I think what those phenomena do do is, is provide a reason for interrogating the claims of science to be a universal form of explanation. And those are fair interrogations. Um, but I, I think tonight, you know, I, I have tackled to the best of my ability some of these big questions of the origin of morality and intelligibility and rationality, all of that. Um, you've just said in your comments that, that you're, you're shying away from some of those big questions. All you're really interested in doing is sort of showing that there are limits to what the paradigm or the worldview that I'm defending can do. Yes. And that you're not going to sort of weigh in in terms of whether the competing paradigm you're putting forward can, can advance us any further. 
But then you've also said that I'm trying to close the door to inquiry, which I find you know, inconsistent, because I'm here doing my best to push forward on inquiry by engaging on these issues, and you, you're not really engaging me on the original morality. You're saying your God can't really deal with that. You're not engaging me on intelligibility or rationality. You're saying you're not sure if your God can deal with that. What can your God do? Well, <laughs> well I think you weren't quite um, fair to what I, what I was saying. Um, your, yours is the substantive claim that science and scientific explanation has the power in principle to explain all phenomena. Is, is that your substantive claim? My, my claim is that if there is any methodology to explain the world, then... Well, method it, methodology doesn't explain the world. I mean, I'm, I'm, <laughs> methodologies are, are, are forms, forms of investigation which yield explanations. Right? I didn't actually finish that sentence. But okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Justin, go ahead. Well, I do have a question. I want to make sure I do get to ask it, because I think it's a good we question. We have lots of time. I think you would want uh, me to ask this one. It was one of the original ones I prepared. It goes back now right. to um, the earlier trio of questions. Remember I said that I had that two-parter. And actually, I want to ask it now, because it connects to the question I just asked. Um, because most of your, your original remarks were, uh, were uh, this more distant, more philosophical ground of being God, the, the is of the universe. Um, of the world, as, as you as you put it, um, but you know, at the end, you you did bring in um, a sort of a monotheistic or a more traditional conception of, of God. Um, this is the Chesterton debate. Uh, you're trained in, in, in uh, Christian uh, the theology, so I, I have to ask you this question: um, Are you defending the God of the Christian faith, uh, which you pivoted to only toward the end of your remarks? And if you are. I'm curious how you get to a God of faith and personal agency, and in particular a Christian God, a God who comes into the world to redeem it, who answers prayers, hosts an afterlife, who is all those things, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, given that your case builds at best a deistic God, and after the last two hours, I'm not even sure it does that. So if, as you state, the existence of God is a kind of demonstrated unknowability, which, I apologize, that might have been in the, the statement you, you sent me. Um, no, so, so still here. Okay, perfect. So if, perfect, then, if, if the existence of God is, is a kind of demonstrated unknowability, to use your words, mm -hmm. then reason would seem to give out precisely as we arrive at that unknowable God, leaving us unable to understand anything at all about that being. Well, um, these are good questions, and, and it enables me to articulate <clears throat> what the limitations of our discussion this evening are. We're here to discuss, does God exist? We're not here to discuss the truth of Christianity. Um, or, more particularly, how you might get from um, affirming the existence of God to affirming the truth of Christianity. Um, I, in my opening remarks, tried to make clear that I think that um, the God who is established by the, argument, by the arguments I've offered this evening in, in my opening statement leaves us with as many questions um, um, as he answers. Um, if I can just quote um, what I said about that um, in my opening remarks, I have them here. The existence of God, by contrast, is an explanation that leads into the unknown, an answer that shapes itself as a question, or rather as several questions. Who is God? Why give the world existence? What does it mean to recognize that the world and we ourselves receive existence rather than possess it? Now, these are some of the questions that I think are, are really left open um, by philosophy's power to encounter God. It's a whole different topic, um, what happens next. But what I think I've tried to show is that these questions do really arise at the horizon of our um, grasp of the world, or of our understanding of the world. So where any religious faith begins, I think, is with such questions. Now, I mean, Justin will quite rightly say that I've done nothing to show how, from such questions, one arrives at a concrete faith in, in Christianity, yeah. for example. And it's, it's quite true, I haven't. And, and that would be another debate, and I wouldn't, 
I, I'd, be, I'd be delighted to have it. Um, but but it's, it's, it's not this one. And, and, and I think that it's important, very important, to keep the, the, the issue separate. Because what we're talking about here are, are philosophical matters, um, proper to what philosophy can discover. Um, uh, Christianity is not proved by philosophy. And Christianity is not a philosophical theorem or, 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 or solution to any problem. Um, what I think is true is that, is that philosophy hinges into theology via the, the mystery of God, which, according to my argument, the existence of the world points to. Um, but how, from our own experience, from our sense of ourselves and of the world and of the patterns that exist in it, the meanings that we find in it, the promises that it seems to have for us, the fears that it seems to evoke for us, how in the wake of that whole complex texture of experience um, we move from the openness of the God question to the concreteness of faith. It's a very real question, but it's also a very large one. I think this is a good place to wind down because I feel like you know, you said earlier in, in our debate that there was something I conceded. I forget what that was, but perhaps it's true that I did. And you seem to be conceding quite a bit there as well, right. and opening the door to a lot of questions. And um, the theme that I've apparently come to is that uh, we share the burden of approaching those questions. And well, I think well, that's something perhaps we can agree on. I, I think yeah. as human beings, we share the burden of approaching those questions indeed, right? Um, but what I think we, 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 we continue to disagree on, um, is, is how far we can get in giving concrete form to those questions um, philosophically. So I think, we, I think we can get further than, than you believe um, before the question... I was going to say the same thing, actually. I think we can get further than you believe. <laughs> <laughs> because we do agree on a lot of things.